the FSR is launching a new initiative that we call FSR Conversations, consisting of interviewing high-level experts in the energy field. And this is the first event of the series. We are interviewing today Candejum Kela. He does not need really introduction, uh, but for the benefit of those that are new to energy access, I will tell you that Candejum Kela is a Sierra Leonean agricultural economist, politician, and international policymaker. He was Minister of, for Trade and Industry in Sierra Leone. Um, he was appointed for two terms, uh, Director General of the United Nations Industrial Development Organization, UNIDO. And he has held several academic positions at Michigan State University, the University of Illinois in the United States. His passion is um, fighting poverty and to promote energy access. In 2005, Kande was appointed United Nations Under Secretary General and a Special Representative of the Secretary General for Sustainable Energy for All. He was also the Chief Executive Officer, the CEO of Sustainable Energy for All Initiative. Presently, he is advising several very important organizations that promote access to energy, clean cooking, capacity building in uh, energy topics, and fighting poverty in general. And I think that exactly at this moment, he's connecting and uh, great to see you. Uh, great Kande. to see you, Ignacio. Yes. yes, that's great to have you with us. Well, I have, I've been telling lots of things about you, uh, all good. Uh, so it's great to have you. Uh, as you know, I am presently in Kampala, Uganda, looking into the last mile electricity access business models and regulation, which is my topic. And yeah, I am. It's great that you are with us. And I will start asking you some questions. Where are you today? I'm in Sierra Leone, in Freetown, Sierra Leone. So hello to everybody in Kampala. Okay, great. Um, okay, so um, let me tell you um, that I mean you have had a, a very distinguished career in politics, international cooperation, many things. Among your very important jobs, you have been the first CEO of Sustainable Energy for All, right? Uh, you were the person who created the institution. Could you tell us something about what Sustainable Energy for All does? Uh, what is different now from what it was when you were there? Uh, what has been accomplished? Tell us something about that. The, the first purpose of establishing the initiative at that time of sustainable energy for all were us for, was for us to mobilize the global community to advocate for a sustainable development goal on energy. And the context is that when the Millennium Development Goals were developed, there was no mention of energy. And many of us found that very ridiculous that we know that you can have sustainable sustained economic growth without reliable electricity. We know that you can't have proper delivery of health services without uh, affordable, reliable electricity supply, and so on and so forth. And um, so we mobilized to establish SDG 7, which says access to affordable, reliable, sustainable, modern energy services. And we helped to define the targets and we had to lobby uh, from small meetings, bringing in corporations, bringing in big political leaders, the World Bank president, uh, uh, Ban Ki-moon himself, using all of that convening power and civil society. We set up a network of over 2,000 uh, uh, civil society groups to back us. And a lot of them, 80% of them, were involved in social services, but they could they realized what energy meant as an enabler to do those. So we achieved our first goal of sustainable energy for all to establish that goal, which many of you know now, SDG 7 and its three targets. Then now the transition is, after we created it, the question was, how do we make, there was a lot of commitments for energy access, especially for the poor. So the question then was, which I raised before leaving sustainable energy for all, 
was how do we convert commitments to kilowatt hours for real people, I used to say. From commitments, getting an SDG, to creating the kilowatt hours that will connect people. And so your discussion of last mile is very relevant here. So now that is where my colleagues are engaged. And uh, we're very pleased that, that we have a good leader now for Sustainable Energy for All, Damil Lola, yep. Ogunjo B, who has vast experience. You know, you couldn't yes, find a yes, better yes. person who has led right. such a program. Yeah. She was the chairwoman of the, uh, Nigeria, right, right. Uh, promoter exactly. of so and, many projects. And our, uh, yes, our focus is not just electrification. Our focus is also access to clean cooking solutions as well. But all of this, if you look at the context of Africa where you are, we say it is to drive economic growth, it is to improve the, the welfare and livelihoods of people, and also it is for environmental sustainability. So we wanted holistic solutions that will keep all of that in mind that Africa needs to grow, Africa needs to create probably 20 million jobs every year for its growing youth population. We need to industrialize and we need our social services, access to clean water, health services all to run properly. Over to you, sir. Well, um, this is what you were doing and what you have accomplished. What are you doing now? What are your, your ongoing projects? <laughs> well, now I, I decided to try politics. As you know, I resigned from Sustainable Energy for All, came back to Sierra Leone to try politics, and people ask me, how could you do that? Well, I am convinced, based on my global experiences now, almost 30 years, that leadership matters. Having leaders in the right places that have a long-term vision, that understand the complexities and opportunities of the 21st century, what energy can, can the kind of growth energy can deliver, the link to climate change and sustainability, the link to digitalization, industrialization. I felt that, hey, with that global experience, I could try my hands in politics. And of course, I was unsuccessful in be becoming president. But I became a parliamentarian, which also has exposed me to the importance of parliament. I decided to run for parliament. So now I have this unique opportunity of representing one of the poorest areas in my country that is also a coastal area. I can see all these impacts of sea level rise. I could also see how dry that area is but I could understand better this whole issue of energy access. In rural communities, we just got our first mini grid and then the realization that the grid extension will not reach that location probably in the next 30 to 40 years. Therefore, all solutions being necessary, grid expansion, but also decentralized energy. But I could also see the trees disappearing. I see the importance of firewood and charcoal in those communities. And I'm saying to myself, how do I change that? So having, for example, a mini grid that can give them more power so that they can cook with sustainable electricity if it is affordable, um, or maybe provide gas. How do they get the canister? So I have this unique opportunity now that from global advocacy, now I am in ground zero. How do I influence uh, access to power and everything it enables for a community of 67,000 people, of the poorest people you can find, who are mainly farmers or fishermen. And then, so I, I do that, and then I am in parliament, um, arguing about public policy, looking at why policy does not work, how it's formulated, do we have information, trying to influence energy solutions there. And later on, I'll tell you about a big achievement we had yesterday for de decentralized energy as we were dealing with the finance bill that I'm so proud of. Then also, I work with people like you, uh, look, doing the global advocacy because we're not there yet. Africa is, on, is not on track to achieve SDG 7, Sub-Saharan Africa. We're not on track. If we're not on track to achieve SDG 7, we still have almost 800, 900 million people without electricity. We're going to add another billion people to our population in another 30 years. The problem is huge. And of course, clean cooking. Still 900 million of us do not have access to clean cooking. And I'm saying to myself, okay, thanks to you, uh, Ignacio, and many others, I am on many global advisory boards on sustainable energy, 
Uh, if you want later on, I can talk about some of those. So I am bridging the global with the national and then the local. So I, I mean, I put it this way. I'm in this wonderful lab, laboratory on public policy um, and trying to connect that with science and analytics, but being grounded at the community village level every month when I go back to my constituents to listen to them. Great. Uh, thank you very much. And, and then let's, let's move to these more international global uh, aspects. Right? So what are the topics that occupy your mind when you are thinking uh, of Africa? What are your concerns? Um, what do you think should be done uh, uh, when you are looking at the global picture of Africa from that level? Well, I'll talk more about Sub-Saharan Africa minus South Africa. Uh, what occupies my mind the most these days is indeed looking at the energy transitions in Sub-Saharan Africa, the challenges and the opportunities. I gave you the numbers earlier. Um, I have almost 620 million of us without uh, access to electricity. And if you look at other energy services, the number is probably still eight, 900 million. And I'm asking myself, how do we accelerate that transition to achieve more access to affordable, reliable energy, uh, to power economic growth and industrialization and jobs? And at the same time, uh, saying to myself, but all technologies are needed here, all of Africa's energy resources. Um, and then I look at the worst impacts of climate change impacting our people, extreme weather events. You know, my country, we're one of the top 10 most vulnerable to climate change. I see the deforestation occurring, the use of firewoods, rapidly spreading urbanization, the forests are disappearing. Uh, and then of course the illegal uh, timber trade. So these things occupy my mind that how do we bring this global knowledge systems so that our, our leaders, politicians, businessmen can understand energy transitions can prioritize energy, but then do sector coupling, looking at energy as an enabler of mining. How does mining create demand for power so that we can attract bigger investments into the energy sector to power mining, because they can pay, but at the same time probably subsidize uh, 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 to make it affordable for, for, for the, the, the poorer, larger poorer masses of Africans. At the same time, I'm looking at opportunities. I say about East Africa, Kenya, Kenya probably can leapfrog into electric vehicles. Why? Because I say, look, if Kenya does it right with their big geothermal opportunities, uh, wind power opportunity, and now oil and gas as a community, the East African community, Tanzania with gas, these people can push access to electricity faster, em em energize their economy, economies, but you know, they probably can leapfrog into electric vehicles, the same way they leapfrog fast into digital communication. Why do I say that? For me, if they integrate their energy resources, Uganda having some oil now, they also have hydropower. Kenya has geothermal and wind. Yeah. And I look at Tanzania with the huge gas resources. These three countries in the East African communities and Mozambique, having integrated programs, pipelines, gas pipelines crossing, interconnection lines, so the grid expansions with interconnection lines, they can be like Brazil, having all their energy resources available, which means they can grow faster economically, make energy cheap, like in uh, Iceland, that they can empower industrialization because they have cheap energy, because they're interconnected, hydro, gas, wind, uh, uh, and some additional thermal power and geothermal power. In addition, hey, they can be talking to Elon Musk to say we want to build the future sun cities, meaning what? They can leapfrog now into electric two-wheelers, three-wheelers, and electric vehicles. Um, you can look again down in the south. Now I include South Africa. Uh, south Africa is the leader on the platinum group of metals. There is a lot of discussion around the world about hydrogen, a renewable hydrogen power. South African companies are looking closely at that. It says to me that even South Africa could lead, and I see their companies already investing in renewable hydrogen. They want to begin to do fuel cells because they have all these 
precious metals that are needed for that revolution. And I see some of their companies now forming consortia to do big solar estates and wind estates, possibly to generate hydrogen power and maybe advance into special hydrogen fuel cells. So you have an African, a cluster of African companies leading the hydrogen energy revolution. The other one is the Central African countries with all these magnesium, manganese, and other metals, cobalt. Uh, Central Africa is sitting on over 50% of the world's cobalt. I say, wait a minute, all this battery technology that Elon Musk wants to do, maybe he should be building the factories in Zambia or Congo. So that again, if you're looking at the global energy transitions between the Southern Africans and the Central Africans and our East African brothers, and sisters, I can see Africa also leading global energy transitions that you, Ignacio, and others talk about globally. So the rest of the world is learning from us. Great. Uh, okay. So uh, all these things that you are talking about, uh, electric vehicles, trade of energy, hydrogen, advanced factories, all these ideas need a lot of capacity building. And I think this is my, my next topic. Um, we realized in Europe in 2004, uh, a group of um, ex-regulators and, and other people from the European Commission that capacity building in regulation of energy was very much needed. And this is how we created the Florence School of Regulation. Uh, this is an activity of the Florence School of Regulation. How do you see the area of capacity building in energy in general, as you are talking about all these uh, uh, technologies and progress that has to be made, and in particular, the very important topic of policy and regulation, capacity building in that. Yeah. I, I know that we are yes. together in this. Yes, well, indeed, um, I am convinced that we Africans can la learn a lot from the European Union countries. Um, in a number of ways when it comes to energy. They trade energy with each other already. Yeah, in fact, the whole EU, I tell people, EU started around coal and, and, and steel. So you, if you look at coal, that is a source of energy. <laughs> and over, over the decades, what the Europeans have done is that they, they've innovated over time, little by little, as they expanded, creating energy-related institutions and public policies to facilitate that energy trade. And if you see my thinking, I'm not thinking dealing with all 50 African countries at the same time. I started going into groups, looking at East Africa, contiguous countries that have an economic and security interest in energy services. So they all benefit. I looked at the Southern African groups, Central Africa, and us in West Africa. How do we integrate our by troops because we have mutual economic interests? So learning from Europe, how did they innovate over four or five decades in creating institutions, public policies to enhance energy trade and energy investments? That's a general category that I think we can learn in terms of cooperation with Europe. But more importantly, to address the issue of regulation. What I have learned now from leading Sustainable Energy for All, working in my own country now, working on industrialization, I have realized that if you're talking about long-term investments, not charity, because sometimes some people feel that, oh, you give a few solar lanterns to people, you're helping them with energy access. I said, you're just shining a light on energy poverty. What we want, in addition to that, is big energy solutions as well. Even if you're going to give household systems, we want to scale that up, not a handful. So if we're looking at an investment approach, long-term transformative investment to power African economies, we need to have the regulations right. I know that now from practical experience. I know that from dealing with some of the biggest banks in the world when we were dealing with sustainable energy issues, Bank of America, uh, Deutsche Bank, CD Group, uh, uh, Brazilian National Development Bank, the multilateral banks. I know today that the bankers will tell you we need predictable public policy. We need long-term public policies that the, the governments will not change every five years. So the, the predictability and sustainability of those policies over time, we need clear regulations. 
this is why um, with you and a number of other partners, we're trying to create this African school of regulators over time. But starting from practical level, meaning what? What are the existing tools for training? What kind of training does African regulators need? If you look at the African regulators, a good number of them in sub-Saharan Africa only emerged in the last 10, 15 years because of the unbundling of the sector. Some are as early as five years ago. So they're learning how to be in this market, what their role is in setting regulations, how do they deal with the politics, the political economy of energy regulation, their role as builders of markets, not just being there to be barriers or representing government interest. So we realize that we need to build capacity in that area. And so we've been, again, what we can learn from the Florence School. Europeans had to come together to create a school like that. Of course, they have many other universities, but they say, how do we bring economics, engineering, finance into this regulatory space so that we can attract bigger investments? I mean, I tell people now, I mean, we're trying to scale up mini grids. Yeah, and that's why I was telling you yesterday was a big day for me in parliament. Yeah, we want to spread mini grids. My country has its first 52 mini grids. The three companies, one of them, by the way, is from East Africa, PowerGen. There's another one, Energy City uh, from Ghana. They're here. They've taken up these 50 mini grids, but they want to scale up. We need more, but probably three, four times that number. But in order to scale up, they need incentives. And yesterday we had a big boost. The finance minister agreed with my colleague and another colleague yesterday in parliament will make them GST uh, free from uh, GST taxes and also will give them five years uh, a grace period not to pay corporate tax. So we need to incentivize these companies. But of course, I hope we can also do uh, uh, some demand side subsidies eventually when governments, when we start earning money from mining, for example, so that we can grow distributive energy as we try to expand the grid. That was a case study for you from Sierra Leone, but the bottom line is capacity building is needed along the whole value chain. So we talked about regulation. We're trying to do this African school of regulators, building on tools that exist in a number of institutions mm -hmm. and African Development Bank, for example. In addition, we need capacity building for energy entrepreneurs that want to do solar household systems, that want to do mini grids. They need quite a bit of capacity building. I've seen companies struggle. They have the first mini grid or the first five, now they want to scale up to 50, they have problems. Uh, how do they train the workers? How do they collect the revenues? Um, again, when you have this integration with um, the mobile payment systems, still collection becomes an issue for some of them. So beyond regulation, capacity building along the value chain, the entrepreneurs that want to do off-grid solutions, they also collect the money, the integration with the uh, mobile payment platforms. So you can see a lot of capacity building needs, but the most important amongst all is to influence the, the policymakers, the presidents, the ministers, not only ministers of energy, but the minister of finance to understand what energy means to an economy, to also avoid what I see happening, firefighting approach to po energy policy. We jump on a solution because we have an emergency. Oh, there's a problem with transmission. So we need some quick uh, uh, transformers and transmitters along the way. Oh, um, suddenly this power plant has blown up. We look for donor support to build another power plant. No, no. We're talking about long-term integrated planning. A plan that is looking at 20 years where there's grid expansion, where there are locations based on some kind of a, 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 a model where off-grid operators know they can operate in a location 10, 15, 20 years until the grid comes and there's advanced thinking if the grid arrives, what happens to those assets? So that kind of planning at the highest level, president, minister of finance, minister of energy, and then for others, it's awareness creation. For the health minister to be able to advocate that I need regular power to make my health service delivery work well, to deliver clean water to the household. And of course, if we jump on clean cooking, I'll spend the whole day. You know, that's my, that's <laughs> yes, my yes, new I pet know. project. Because globally, Ignacio, you and others, you've made a lot of success uh, out of electrification. But we've not moved the needle one inch on 
on clean cooking. We're way behind. We've not achieved much. Yep, yep. Well, you have been talking about Europe. Uh, Europe and Africa are together and they have to do things together. Uh, there is an alliance, African Union, European Union, that will try to do things, to accomplish things. And you are involved in that, I know. I am <laughs> partly also. Uh, could you tell us more about this alliance and what, what could be expected from it? Yes. Well, um, I had the privilege a year ago to chair a sustainable energy investment platform for the European Union and the African Union. And I'm very grateful to you and over 50 professionals from Africa and Europe who contributed to one year, almost one year of work in thinking about how Europe and Africa could, could cooperate in the energy space. And we did well, we looked at power generation, we looked at uh, transmission, we looked at distribution. So for bulk power, we also looked at uh, the opportunities for renewable energy. We looked at clean cooking, and of course, some of the cross-cutting issues of finance, capacity building, energy trade, power pools, and so on. Based on some of that work, the EU and the African Union in this new African alliance that is led now by the Friends of Europe, that has Mo Ibrahim, our, our African digital uh, revolution pioneer uh, from the Mo Ibrahim Foundation. We have about five former African heads of states, very senior leaders in Europe, including commissioners of the EU Commission, uh, the African Union Commission as well. So they've decided to take some of that work and move it another another level. So they formed a new, uh, they're forming a new task force to look now at practical ways. You and I and others identify the challenges and the opportunities. So then that begs the question now, how do we make it happen? How do we do the business to business partnerships between utilities in Europe and utilities in Africa to deal with the many problems you and I mentioned about sector governance in the bulk energy production, transmission and distribution? How do we help to build this transmission backbones between countries so that they can trade energy services across borders. How do we make it happen? That kind of a business partnership. Also for decentralized or distributive energy, still a lot of challenges in a number of African countries. How do we incentivize it? Some, uh, how do we harmonize policies? In some countries, you have to go for a license even for less than one, one megawatt. Um, in others, you don't have to. In my country, as I said, we have now zero, zero duty no GST payment. Now we're giving corporate five-year uh, grace period for corporate taxes for mini-grid operators. But still, you need uh, cheaper financing for those uh, uh, mini-grid operators to scale up. How can Europe come in? And the whole area of capacity building, the demand for capacity building is so high. So the key question here is, how do we use uh, uh, foreign aid to build capacity? Remember, investors don't come into a country and say, oh, okay, uh, Ignacio, we're bringing you in to help them plan for 10 years. No, what that money comes from the development banks or the donor community for that, that long-term planning. So how do we tap into resources to do that long-term integrated planning we want? Yeah, based on some of the work you and some of your colleagues at MIT, African Development Bank and ECA have done. So how do we get donor money into all this public policy work we want, all the capacity building market development part of it, but also donor money and domestic public capital to de-risk investments. African energy markets in a number of places are still risky. So how do we get some public capital, whether donor, multilateral money, bilateral or national money to de-risk some investment and let's face it, provide some subsidies. Um, I told you the case of my village. I have, we have a mini grid now, but it's damn too expensive for the locals. The operator wants to expand, but my people are so poor that we need to support them to use that energy for irrigation, to use that energy to mill rice, in, enhance their productivity in agriculture. So for, to acquire some of those additional technologies that will enable them to use the energy, we're going to need additional programs. So that is what this new Africa Alliance led by the Friends of Europe will try to do. In addition, 
we want to support the school of regulators. We are also convinced in that group that we need proper regulations. We need to help these countries. So how do we see if EU and others can finance? Remember, we need first year, we need about $2 million for the first two years. But for the long term, we need to mobilize about $10 million going forward so that it becomes a sustainable institution working with regulators, partnering them with regulators in Africa and also in Europe. So um, another area, of course, is clean cooking. Uh, doing proper planning for clean cooking, uh, attracting investments there. Like now, you see in the case of Rwanda, Rwanda has just received the first program from the World Bank that will that is a huge program for clean cooking, the first of its kind in Africa, 10 million in grants from the Clean Cooking Fund and another 10 million in IDA money to help with everything I have said, sector planning, support to the private sector, and then they leverage probably another $80 million from markets so that they can bring build the infrastructure for bringing clean cooking solutions to communities in, 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 in Rwanda. Our hope is that model can spread to other countries. So this new partnership with Europe, and thank you, you I'm always calling on you when, when you think you should rest. Now <laughs> I'm asking you again, I've given your name, that you and some other uh, folks from Africa and our good friend Damilola has also agreed to be in that group. But it's going to be a high-powered group with technicians and policymakers um, in that group to be able to drive all of this, a good partnership between Europe and Africa to drive energy access, investments in energy, but also move them towards the transition to cleaner, greener energy using all of Africa's energy resources in the process. Well, uh, great answer. Um, although I have more questions, I see that uh, the, the people who are listening have been sending some questions. So I'm going to pick a couple of them. And then um, there is one from Tony Kim Ji saying, sustainable energy for all has acknowledged that reducing the carbon intensity of energy while making it available to everyone requires a radical rethinking of the way the world produces, distributes, and consumes energy. This is taken from the, the website of Sustainable Energy for All. Yeah. And the question for you is, how would you describe this radical thinking for Sustainable Development Goal 7 in order to ensure just yeah. and inclusive transition? I, I like the question because it helps people understand that when we were developing sustainable energy for all, we were not just thinking about energy access for the poor. We also wanted those who have uh, benefited so much and industrialized already from cheap energy over the decades, that in fact, they also can contribute to uh, uh, climate change mitigation. So we included that uh, target there to double the annual rate of improvement of energy efficiency by 2030. It was very deliberate that sustainable energy for all is not just about developing countries. It is also to help these advanced countries uh, uh, accelerate their transition to more energy efficiency. And um, again, let me put a footnote, and it's good the question came up, that that's one area where the rich countries have been failing. In fact, last year, the International Energy Agency launched a commission, which I'm, I was serving on, to accelerate action on energy efficiency. Because we found out that most of the OECD countries had not improved their energy efficiency or reduced their energy intensity as much as they had promised. Yeah, we're, we're happy that you help the poor countries achieve access, but you also, because you're creating more problems for the planet, by not taking the right actions you, sh you should take at the scale you sh should take it to reduce energy intensity. So sustainable energy is continuing in that, in that light. I'm very happy to see my successor, uh, Dami Lola, in fact, is one of the co-conveners of the next climate summit. Uh, this is how much sustainable energy for all has a high profile CEO. She's going to co-host uh, uh, that event uh, in the UK with the Minister of Energy of the United Kingdom, because we need to drive that. We also need to drive to enhance the share of renewables in the global energy mix. It is not moving as fast as we had hoped. Remember, we wanted to double the share of renewables. But our main thesis now is we combine advances in energy efficiency 
with advances in renewable energy deployment. Yeah, we need energy efficiency in end use appliances so that mini grids can work well. We need energy efficiency to manage energy demand in, in systems so that you don't have to generate more, you don't have to use more fossil fuels. But if you bring it again to the developing country context, African context, we need a lot of work on energy efficiency. Ignacio notes that for some of our African countries, transmission losses are between 30 to 45%. Sometimes people say, well, energy efficiency is not for us. Of course it is for us. We're losing already 30 to 40% of what we produce just in transmission. By the time you look at all the technical losses at the generation level, you're losing almost half the power you generate for various reasons. So energy efficiency is relevant for Africa as well. In fact, public buildings um, in my country, and I know it's happening the same uh, for utilities, maybe in Uganda, the biggest debtor to the utility is the government. You know, the, most of the ministries are not paying their bills. So we argue that, look, maybe we make them more energy efficient simply changing the light bulbs and other measures within those public utilities so they demand less energy from the system. They're already owing so much, they're refusing to pay. Maybe we reduce how much they demand. I give you an anecdote. I went to India a few years ago and I met with the then Minister of Energy. But I went to a friend of mine who was also the Minister of Petroleum, uh, sorry, of Railways, of Railways. The railways were one of the biggest users of power in India. Right. And he said to me, Mr. Yumkela, we want to make our, our systems more efficient, but guess what? We have all these open rooftops in railway stations. Maybe we can use them to generate power for the grid. And I said, that's the joined up thinking we need. That's sector coupling thinking. So uh, what I said about uh, Africa, energy technical losses in the system applies to countries like India as well. So very brilliant question. These are all areas that my colleague, uh, the successor, Dami Lola, is addressing within the context of climate uh, resilience, but also advancing uh, green energy transitions. Uh, by the way, I didn't even talk about industrial energy efficiency, which oh, yeah. is a big area when I was at UNIDO. We used to also push. Uh, one of the big areas, if you want to stay uh, within 1.5 degrees, is to decarbonize not only power generation, which contributes probably two thirds of the greenhouse gases, but also in electrifying and industrializing energy uh, in the industrial, uh, sorry, the industrial sector. So the whole issue there of energy efficiency in industrial energy efficiency is a big deal. And I know South Africa and some other countries are looking at that. It is good for the bottom line, but it's also good for, for, for climate. If you look at the heavy energy users, cement, pharmaceuticals and petrochemicals and so on, these are all big users of energy where energy efficiency issues apply. Therefore, we put in that second target on doubling the annual rate of energy efficiency improvement in sustainable energy for all. Well, I think we have arrived to the limit of the time that we have been given. Uh, I don't know if you want to add anything. Um, and you have, I, it has been a fascinating interview. I hope that everybody has enjoyed it as much as I have. We could not have had a better uh, person to start uh, these FSR conversations. Uh, thank you very much, Kande. And I hope that we will meet many times doing the, all the things that you are promoting. Thank you. Well, I just, I just will say thank you to you, Ignacio. If Africa has a friend, it is you. I know your many trips to Uganda, Nigeria, or Kenya and other countries just helping us have this overall thinking as you've done at the Florian School for all of Europe. Thank you, but we are with you. And just to say to the audience, Africa needs to move faster. We are way behind in many areas, but we can be pioneers and leaders as I expressed, as I expressed.